The I've been doing this for a long time. Uh, obviously, is sort of that interesting piece of uh, how old are you? And uh, I walked in the room with Bill O'Neill, who was here a minute ago. If he's not still here, uh, I think he's the only person in the room who's done Taver longer than I have, or before I did. And um, it's not it's not hard for you to imagine. And many of you saw some of the beginnings of it. But this is almost a, a story of, uh, I've been doing this for a long time, or uh, can you tell age by the number of dog years you've done Taver? So uh, this is, uh, this is uh, obviously 1999. Mac decided something was changing in the world, and he better learn to cath. And so this was a case where I gave him the wire for a 99% LAD. And, you know, Mike's come on to become a cardiologist as well as a surgeon over time. And that led us, uh, you know, through this when Cribier did the first case in 2002 and things unfolded in the mid aughts. So I'm going to use this just to tell a story about a patient and remembering it's still about the patient. This just is, me this is meant to be um, a cute State of the Union piece of where we were whenever there were, you know, 34 people in the room for every case we did. But this, um, this guy is an 88-year-old West Texas cabinet maker. You can read it. He's a, he was a Marine. His first name is Major. He was an enlisted man, but whenever he wanted something for the colonel, the colonel would tell him to go get something, he would call him up and say, this is Major so-and-so, I need a Jeep. So he would get pretty much whatever he wanted just with his first name. Um, a really interesting, you know, nice West Texas guy. And uh, he was frustrated because he still had mesquite trees to cut down. And his family said he was the best cabinet maker west of Dallas. So uh, he was anxious to get this thing fixed. Um, you know, we can take a lot of pictures and, and show everything. Many of you experienced some of this, uh, but I was hoping that Bill would still be here. Uh, you have to buy him a drink at the bar to talk about, you know, when we went to the first case, uh, one of the first cases at Columbia, uh, literally it was standing room only. The room was packed. There were people spilling out in the hall. They kind of shoved Mac and I in the hall and just everybody wants to see this and do it. And you, you know all the parts and pieces that we went through to get here. Um, our surgeons were, um, you know, somewhat the smartest guy in the room and knew and thought that cardiologists were slobs and there was no way that you had a sterile enough environment in the cath lab or that we could do this without infecting our patients if we didn't do it in the OR. The only problem was we didn't have a hybrid lab. So we did the first cases with a C arm. Uh, and the only problem with that was it turns out you can't see the valve. So we did the first two cases. In the second case, Lars Svensson was there, Samir had been there, and uh, we deployed the valve. It looks kind of good. Uh, and the next thing you see is this valve spinning in the aorta. Like we kind of missed the entire annulus and uh, the entire part of the, the aorta that we were after. Uh, so then we moved to the cath lab and had real imaging. The other interesting part of it was um, in uh, a steering committee, uh, probably around 2005, uh, a lot of things were going on and I asked Mac, Craig Smith, and Lars how many patients they had turned down for surgery with aortic stenosis the year before. And the answer was zero. This was easy. You know, hey, we, don't, we could cure aortic stenosis. Anybody, you send us anybody up to 100, we can fix them. And then they all came crawling out of the woodwork, and you know the rest of the story. They got to see inoperable patients, and we got to go through these things for a while. So uh, with that in mind, you know, some of the early stuff, just as, this is in-hospital outcome. In a minute, we'll compare it to one-year outcome, but you can see the numbers, numbers that nobody is proud of. We were causing all kinds of vascular complications, putting in the 24-28 French sheath. Um, I first started closing in with, you know, three proglides, and we, uh, you know, we created enough catastrophes uh, that we managed to save most of, uh, that, that we lived on edge every time we were gonna do a case. And you can imagine what uh, some of that did to us. So how did we get here, uh, you might ask? Uh, well, this is what you all see and do now, right? I mean, this is just a different world. Uh, we don't even really get them to moderate sedation. Um, I had to teach the surgeons, stop telling the anesthesiologist they're moving, 
all right? We want them to move, we like them to move, we want them to be awake, we want them to get up and move. So uh, much like all of you now, uh, no cut downs, uh, none of the other fancy stuff, it's just get the case done. So what does that lead to? Well, it moves from the difference of taking, you know, half a day and all kinds of arrangements to get a case done uh, to we try to have four cases done by noon so our anesthesiologist can play golf at one. I'd like to tell you I'm kidding, but I'm not. Um, and generally, uh, we're going to do the case in 20 to 30 minutes. Um, we don't, we're not trying for records, but oftentimes the case will, uh, in very slow, methodical pace, unfold and be 18 or 19 minutes skin to skin. So it's a dramatic difference about where we are and where we've been. Uh, I'm going to show you something in the story that if you were here whenever Adam was talking this morning about, you know, what's unfolding in the future. Here's the, you know, we had him in the hospital a week. We had ICU for two or three days. We had the world checking on him. You know, nobody got rounded on more than they did. Today, uh, we are near 85% with one day discharge and 95% of them go home in less than two days. And this is people going home, all right? So this isn't the in-hospital outcome we talked about a while ago, but this is now uh, one-year outcomes. And, you know, there's a multiplicity of different things with different trials, different valves, uh, and even the TVT registry is headed in this direction. Essentially what we call zero mortality, looking to go 12 consecutive months with zero mortality in a lot of things. And um, you, you know where all that's come. All the reasons why we could do it from technology to experience to volumes. And uh, many of you know uh, Bruce Lytle, who built uh, the Heart and Vascular Institute at Cleveland for over uh, 35 plus years. And uh, he, he came to join us after that bit. And so Bruce said, you know, for a long time that TAVR is not real heart surgery. He even now has come to accept that the TAVR in 2019 is not real heart surgery because this is replacing the aortic valve with virtually nothing happening. So can you turn that up by any chance? Do you have volume of that? No? So I'm sure you can't hear this. It's just on my computer, I think, right? Um, so this was uh, fourth case of the day with a little bit before noon start. And um, this is him, you know, after his case is done. He's awake in bed. He's 88 years old. And uh, I'm fundamentally asking him, uh, you know, what does he want to get back to do? And the issue was that he wanted to get back to cutting down his mesquite trees, chopping wood, and making cabinets. And literally, as I said earlier, his, uh, his family uh, told me the bit I said a while ago. And uh, so the end of this piece is I simply told him that he needed to get better, get up and go home because I needed some cabinets for the new house. So that's at uh, 1.30. And I'm sorry you're not going to be able to hear this. but. Uh, he had lunch at 2.30, he was up in the chair, started walking at four, and uh, five, he started walking two laps and three laps, and he just kept walking um, about the time the, uh, our nurse practitioner called me. And uh, fundamentally, the John Webb's obligatory breakfast that you most know is, this is him at obviously 5.30, um, and he had been walking all these laps. I was talking to him about that and uh, asked him if he had had lunch, and I'd heard that he'd had breakfast for lunch. What'd you have for lunch? And his answer was that he had scrambled eggs, pancakes, toast, jelly and butter, and coffee, his coffee. So I said, did you have bacon? He said, nope, no bacon, protected my heart. And um, fundamentally, this is me telling him he's done everything, got a new valve, he's up walking, he's breathing normally, he's dressed and uh, there's probably no reason to keep him in the hospital. So 
He went home at 6.30, post Tavers LOS, six hours. Um, you can imagine all the things to say about this and uh, all the assaults. So I won't even try to justify it, but um, I have fundamentally sent people home with PCI, uh, with pacemakers, with virtually everything for over 20 years, and uh, sent AAA uh, you know, aneurysms home the next day whenever the surgeon says it wasn't kosher. So this is part of uh, what we do, and um, Molly has taken this piece and turned our entire institution into essentially a 24-hour discharge, and you've got to really do something special to not go home in less than 24 hours. So uh, thank you very much.